Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll learn about A.C. Townley uh, in an excerpt from our new documentary on the Nonpartisan League. But first, joining us now is our guest, Greg Tavine. Greg, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, great to be here. As, as we get started, you're here as Executive Director of Emerging Prairie. But uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about you and yourself, where you're originally from, and a little background. Yeah, I grew up on a farm in the area, um, out near Harwood, Riley's Acres, uh, a family that was very committed to their community, to their neighbors, just had a really great childhood, grew up with my best friends, playing backyard baseball, involved in the community. Uh, went to the University of Minnesota, wandered around the world for a year, and uh, in 2011 moved back to Fargo, and I fell in love with it. It was the first time I had lived downtown. I got an opportunity to work for Doug Burgum, uh, fell in love with the city, fell in love with ideas, and, and then I met a girl. And uh, so I have an amazing wife that runs Love Always Floral downtown. We just had a new baby, uh, so a little sleep deprived, uh, but just a guy that loves North Dakota, believes in our community, and uh, loves to support entrepreneurs. Yeah, well, love will do funny things. <laughs> uh, well, you're here today to talk about Emerging Prairie. What is Emerging Prairie? Emerging Prairie is a nonprofit that's been around for about five years. And we exist to uh, connect and celebrate our entrepreneurial ecosystem. So we believe entrepreneurs drive the economy and artists drive our culture. We focus a lot of our energy uh, on supporting tech-based startups. Uh, we do that through a variety of ways, conferences, uh, co-working space, uh, convenings. And uh, we're probably most known for One Million Cups, which we facilitate every week. Uh, just today there was uh, 195 folks um, listening to two entrepreneurs share their ideas. We're also part of the team that puts on TEDx Fargo, uh, which will have close to 2,200 folks there this summer. Uh, we're trying to spread ideas, change a culture to possibility, and support the risk takers that are trying to improve the human condition. Okay. Uh, what, let's talk then, you've got an upcoming conference, the Drone Focus Conference. Where and when is that? Yeah, it's coming up at the, just in a few days, May 30th, May 31st at the Fargo Civic Center. This will be our fourth one. It started off as an idea. We planned it in 30 days. We got 140 folks. The next year we had 330 people. We sold out the stage at Island Park. And now we're at the Fargo Civic Center for our second year. Why, why a drone focus conference? Well, I think if you look at the current trends in technology, unmanned aircraft vehicles, uh, it, it's an emerging technology. Uh, it, it's an area that North Dakota as a state has invested a tremendous amount of dollars into with our test site, with our military activity here. There's folks that are involved in the space and emerging technology companies. We think about the ecosystem around that. So you think about Microsoft and, and their, their product Azure that's storing tremendous amounts of data in the cloud. We look at the local workforce challenge where we're having a hard time getting enough folks to fill the jobs but autonomous vehicles can sometimes do the work. I think about the pioneering work that XL Energy is doing is uh, during a snowstorm, uh, there's power lines in rural North Dakota. Well, they're working to have drones fly those lines versus putting our friends and family in harm's way, sending them out to check the power. Hmm. Well, uh what other locations are there in addition to the Civic Center? So it's, we, we activate the downtown. We think about downtown Fargo as our canvas. So there will be the Civic Center as our host, but there will be lunches around the community in different restaurants where we have workshops. There'll be a post party on Broadway. We call it our opportunity fair. So folks that are looking to hire drone service companies for their work in construction or maybe in the energy industry are going to be there trying to sell the audience. People that are hiring like Midco or they're trying to find talent to join their team. Uh, but we bring a festival type atmosphere to it. The other thing that's fun with Drone Focus is we have a Drone Focus International Film Festival. So we had over 50 submissions from around the world come in and during the conference we show these films. Uh, last year the winners were truly excited. I'm not, uh, excited. I'm not allowed to share any of the winners, but I've got a chance to look at some of the films and it's jaw dropping. These drones are capturing some of the most beautiful film um, in places that are hard to reach. 
Well, absolutely. Uh, well, then what are some of the things that will be the focus of this year's conference? So this year the theme is looking at the future of the autonomous nation. We think about how does the private industry connect with policymakers and early stage technology companies. Uh, there's growing trends with autonomous activity. Where I believe we will live in a world where autonomous vehicles are used for transportation, where they're used for delivery. Um, and we're looking at that intersection. And, and that's where there's sometimes confusion. How, how does the policy uh, integrate with the technology? We look at our content on the main stage as folks that are deeply involved, but they're also technology. And we look at the potential of technology to improve the human condition. And, and so one of the folks that we're trying to bring in from Manhattan is using drone technology to get um, blood, um, blood, um, packages to folks in rural areas that have been in a crash where they don't have time to get that person to the hospital, but could the drone bring the blood to them in a critical time? Hmm. You know, you, you hit on it though, though some, but can you expand on the meaning of building the future of an autonomous nation? Well, we have to think about what is the future of our cities going to look like? Are we going to have four lane roads? Are you going to own a car? I don't think I will. Uh, I've talked to folks that are bankers that finance gas stations. I believe that's not going to be relevant very long. I believe my daughter who was just born will probably never own a vehicle, but she'll have access to an autonomous vehicle. She'll punch a, punch a button. That car's going to come pick her up. It's going to drop her off and it's going to pick up the next person. Um, I think we need to think about policy, how uh, goods and services are delivered. We know that big organizations are looking at that. But how do cities design for the autonomous nation? I know the city of Fargo is bringing people from police, from fire, search and rescue, because they're looking at how this technology can support their efforts. And so I think it's happening in big industries. I think it's happening at a municipal level. And we're trying to get folks thinking on this narrative, telling the story of what could be if we work together. Hmm. Well, now wait a minute, let's back up, take a step back. What exactly are drones? I mean, most people think a drone is something they buy their, their child to fly at Christmas or the, the military drones. And I'm sure those are drones, but can, what is a drone? Yeah, I think for me, it's an autonomous vehicle. It is something that runs without humans, and they're getting smarter and smarter. Uh, probably easiest to think about them as a robot. Drones are used in the sky where there's less friction. They're used on the ground, which could be an autonomous vehicle. They're used as submarines, um, so underwater. Uh, they're an autonomous vehicle that has technology that uh, could be considered artificial intelligence that is helping them make decisions, move, move out of vehicles' ways, um, navigate, and, and generally perform a task it's been given. Mm -hmm. You've hit on some of these already, but in what areas are drones currently used in our society? I said militaries, uh, people seem to understand and know pretty quickly, but what other ways are they really being used? Well, I think um, from a hobbyist point of view, there are kids that are flying drones for fun. Mm -hmm. We know those kids. They're generally uh, high energy young people. It's being used in construction. It's being used in film. It's being used in television. Richard Weiss, uh, who has a TV show, I believe, on your channel, Born to Explore, he uses drones to capture his footage that you produce and distribute across the country. Uh, we're watching more and more in energy. We're working with the Petroleum Council, where they've got service providers' uh, needs uh, to monitor the pipelines. Is there a breach? Is there something going on? We know the railroad is looking at using drones to cover their tracks, so safety. Uh, we think about engineering, the bridges. Could we send a drone out to check if a bridge Bridges um, is safe. And so I think it's coming in a lot of ways. Uh, I think some folks are nervous about will Amazon just be sending out packages. I think several of us want to push a button and a drone delivers a pizza. I know I do. Um, but I think drones are going to be integrated into our daily life. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, here at Bray Public, we're looking at a drone to inspect towers and save somebody from climbing that tower. Uh, for, for routine inspections, but is there a potential downside to drone technology? Well, I think absolutely, right? Um, there's a concern on will the machines take over humans. I think that that has been part of most science fiction films, books uh, for years. I think there's also a concern on privacy. Um, I think folks want to know, can I do what I need to do for in our home right now? My wife is breastfeeding, and so could a drone pop into a, uh, one of our windows and capture that and, and, and impact our family? I think those are always concerns. I believe we have smart people that work on policy to help us. 
And, and I think human destruction. I think that there is concern on are we at risk in the concept of war. Um, I was in the Pentagon recently where they're looking at how grassroots groups are using drones to defeat U.S. military missiles. And sometimes the smaller machines are outperforming the very expensive uh, legacy technologies. And so I think that there's reason for concern, yet from my point of view, I believe humans are good and we have a lot of really smart folks trying to use um, the technology with respect to humanity. Okay. How's that for an answer? Was that? It was very good. Yeah, let's talk, let's go back and talk about uh, some of your student and venture capital pitches that that will happen or can happen at the conference. So Emerging Prairie believes we need to create platforms for entrepreneurs to share their work. So two of the priorities we have are to get early stage companies an opportunity to share with the audience what they're working on. Now it might lead to an opportunity for partnership, maybe there's a capital need someone may fill in, but it gives new ideas to get off the ground. Last year, Project Phoenix uh, talked about its two-sided platform, helping drone service providers connect with folks like me that might need the product, and they're building a platform. They had an opportunity to do that. We also do a student venture pitch, uh, where students are sharing their ideas. Uh, the, the first year we did it, students from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, outperformed the PhD student uh, from Syracuse. It was awesome. Last year we had folks from Colorado there, uh, a student from Nebraska really turned some heads. We believe giving young people uh, the opportunity to share their ideas uh, helps the whole crowd see that a new generation might be approaching the problems from a different viewpoint. Hmm. Now, who are some of your keynote speakers you're going to have? Uh, we're excited. Um, we have the third in line person at Department of Transportation, uh, Tran Transportation Derek Kahn, uh, who works uh, out of DOT, and he's ahead of UAS policy. He's going to be giving a talk. The, the Governor Burgum, Senator Hoven, deep supporters. We've got some invitations out to folks um, that work in a very key house that has a certain color in Washington, D.C., um, hopefully going to be joining us. But we also have folks that are emerging technologies. Um, I think of um, a couple of the young people that are coming, Skyward.io, which has unique abilities with the FAA, Nick Flom from the test site in Grand Forks that is truly a thought leader in this space. And we got some invitations out to some industry leaders that we believe are going to say yes. Um, and even from a policy point, uh, we have the gentleman from the FAA that's the head of um, unmanned aircraft system integration confirmed to attend. So he's flying in from Washington, D.C. just to attend the conference. I think we have speakers from 16 different states, four countries. One of the guys is an MIT cat from, that's doing work in Alaska with this technology. The National Association of Tower Erectors, folks that you're thinking about, they're coming and they're bringing the folks that are working with them. It's a world-class lineup of speakers. And what I love about it, as a millennial with a short attention span, we give them up to 12 minutes. So they're four-minute talks, eight-minute talks, at most 12. So it's quick. Hmm. Wow, yeah. Well, you mentioned uh, Emerging Prairie's focus, entrepreneurial ecosystem. Can you expand on what does that really mean? Yeah, if you think about an ecosystem, it has things that are growing, some that are dying, they're growing on top of each other, some get strong, some get weak. Uh, we're committed to supporting entrepreneurs, but we know it takes the whole ecosystem. So we partner with North Dakota State University to get their students access to one million cups, or it might be somebody from outside the area coming to the community where we celebrate them. It's big corporations. I think about border states, big organization, but they're doing cutting edge work. We need their team meeting with the entrepreneurs. We look at Midco as they increase their database capabilities. We know that that's helping our early stage companies grow. So we think it takes all of us. It takes a village. It takes the entrepreneurs themselves. It takes the folks that are crazy enough to follow their wild ideas, the staff, but it also takes the community. And so we believe it's a healthy, vibrant community that supports entrepreneurs, not one organization. There's the Economic Development Corporation, focused on primary sector. They really help, but the chamber is supporting its members. It really takes all of us to truly support an entrepreneur. Hmm. Well, I understand internships are a big part of what you do, too. Can, what, what, is, what do you do there? Yeah, if you look at the, the regional landscape, we know that talent attraction is important. So we do soft skill development for our internship program. It's a six weeks program where we bring in professionals to do soft skill development for interns. We've had folks from Microsoft and Border States, Kilbourne Group get involved. And then we hire interns and we believe 
that the North, the North Dakota as a state has committed resources to support Innovate ND, which provides for internship opportunities. We try to get interns plugged into these early stage companies and to develop their soft skills. Uh, we believe they're a critical part of the solution to so many challenges. They have great ideas. And uh, we encourage all businesses to think about adding an intern. I mean, you could have one right here. I mean, they could just be interviewing me. You could take the day off. <laughs> now, here's a thought. You know, uh, Talk about some of the area startup companies that you all focus on. Well, I mean, every week at Woman and Cubs, it's one or two organizations that are brand new. So we cover about 40 or 50 of those every year. Uh, but some folks that you might be intrigued by, Peter Chamberlain's moving to the area. Uh, he's an MIT master's student that is building WalkSmart, and he's creating an opportunity for... Um, uh, for seniors to know, uh, for, the, for children and family members of senior citizens to know if they fell on their walker. Are they using their walker? It's using technology to monitor that behavior. Co-schedule, we're watching just grow. They're a calendar marketing app. I think about some of the activity at the research and tech park. Ray Barry and his team at Omnibyte, it's getting bigger and stronger. They're solving real problems for folks. And I think it's a variety of areas. Um, uh, there seems to be some trends in emerging technologies in agriculture uh, with sensors. And then the research and tech park at NDSU is finding that great talent on campus and they're kicking out these ideas. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of farmers are very interested in all this technology. Uh, but what about older generations and younger generations? The older say, oh, nobody, we're always going to drive cars. You know, how, how is that going to merge here over the next few years? So how do you see the technology changing? You said your daughter would probably never have a car. Yeah, and I'm uh, the son of a farmer um, that might think differently generationally. Uh, but, but I think that I think things are coming together. I think in North Dakota we have a need on, we need talent, we need folks to continue working on things. Uh, we at Emerging Prairie host a conference called Cultivate on Emerging Technology and Agriculture. And one of the highlights of the conference, I think you would have really enjoyed it, maybe you could moderate it next year, was the Angry Farmer panel. Turns out there's a fair amount of angry farmers. Um, and what they were sharing is that some of these folks' frustration with technologists that assume that they can sit in their office away from the farm and just, just um, make up solutions that aren't needed. And, and so I think there is a tension, but I think it's healthy. I think there's a generational transfer. I think um, people have grown up with the smartphone for a long time. I think the internet's here to stay. And uh, people are finding ways to be more efficient. And, and I think the blend and the tension is really good. Today at One Million Cups, we had a gentleman that is a titan of industry talking about how he said, I just want to help the new founders. And mm -hmm. I think there's more and more of a desire from maybe the generations that are a little older than me to want to go back and help these new, new folks out. But I think the difference is there's a spirit of collaboration amongst my generation. We don't see it as a zero sum game. I see a lot more sharing resources, sharing ideas, and uh, the, the, the tide going up is, is helping all ships uh, rise. Absolutely. Well, how can people uh, get registered or uh, attend the conference? So with Drone Focus, dronefocuscon.com or check out emergingprairie.com. Uh, we'll be selling tickets up until May 29th if we don't sell out. If some of these key folks that we've invited show up, it, it might be hard, but I, I'm sensing that we're going to have a pretty full house with folks from across the country. Hmm. Well, with that said, Greg, if people want more information, and not necessarily about the upcoming conference, but Emerging Prairies, where can they go? Who can they contact? So Emerging Prairies is a great place to start. We have a newsletter we send out every week where we're sharing opportunities for folks in the entrepreneurial ecosystem from around the region. So there's a newsletter, emergingprairie.com. They can sign up for that? Yeah, sign yeah. up for that. It's, of course, free. Um, and then uh, Twitter, uh, Greg from Fargo, we're Emerging Prairie. Instagram, you can follow uh, our activities there. Uh, but the thing is, is like just get involved. We encourage folks to come to One Million Cups every Wednesday morning or show up at TEDx. We live in a vibrant, energetic community, and uh, we just hope more folks will enjoy it. Yeah. Greg, we're out of time. It sounds interesting. Good luck to you. Thank you, sir. All right. Stay tuned for more. In 1914, the unthinkable happened in the state of North Dakota. After decades of control by Minnesota railroads and the Minneapolis Chamber of Commerce, North Dakota farmers organized and took control of state politics, implementing the successful program of reforms that led to the state-owned Bank of North Dakota and the state mill. Leading the charge was Minnesota native A.C. Townley. 
Townley is a pretty compelling figure, and I think that's why he's so prominent in, in the memory of those who still think about and remember the Nonpartisan League. Townley offers us, in some ways, an easy way to think about the Nonpartisan League, because if we can understand Townley, this way of thinking goes, we can understand the League. Townley was actually born in Minnesota. He was the eldest, or at least the eldest son of a fairly large family from Browns Valley, Minnesota. And at one time he would say he was kind of forced out because there are enough kids and not enough work. Anyway, he leaves the nest uh, fairly soon. Ends up around Alexandria, uh, Minnesota, where he uh, does some school teaching and ends up going into business with his brother and they try farming around Beach, North Dakota, right up against the Montana border. That doesn't work out. He goes to Colorado and tries farming again, and that doesn't work out. And then he comes back to the beach region, and it looks like he's going to hit the home run. And uh, he was going to have the perfect flax crop. He had borrowed money. He had bought tractors. He was going to strike it rich. And then um, supposedly uh, there's an early frost, and the crop withers, and um, the flax king never was the flax king. Everything that he thought he'd built up and was looking forward to, house of cards, it just all falls down. As he decides not to try farming again. He turns towards politics. He floats into the Socialist Party in early 1913. The Socialist Party is in North Dakota. The Socialist Party has an organization in 1913 in all the states. Townley gets involved in that effort and he immediately develops a reputation within just weeks as someone who can speak to farmers as a former farmer himself. And Townley starts to develop this sales pitch, and the sales pitch is largely about what the farmers have wanted and not gotten. And he goes to the Socialist Party leadership back in Minot and says, look, I think I have a way to bring more people into the Socialist Party. These farmers that won't sign up, I think I can figure out how to get them signed up. He's an original recruiter in that he sells socialism light uh, as opposed to true socialism. You can see Marx and Lenin spinning when you, when you talk about Townley. And he ultimately gets canned from uh, being a socialist recruiter, just not exactly what they wanted as a super salesman. Ends up without a job and for reasons that only he could explain, ends up going to watch the 1915 state legislature. And in the process, Townley and some of his friends sit down and start hammering out what they initially call the Farmers Nonpartisan League, which after a while becomes the Nonpartisan League. Now, some commentators on the Nonpartisan League, both at the time and in the period since, have argued that in fact, Townley offered himself up as kind of a Moses figure to these farmers. In some ways, it's about as much as I want to understand about Arthur Townley because I don't want to conflate the movement with Arthur Townley. I think that's one of the mistakes that has been made by previous chroniclers of the Nonpartisan League, is that it's so seductive, it's so tempting to let him be the stand-in, be the way in which we understand the League and all the parts of it. So I, I don't want to confound you, um, but I don't, I, don't, I don't actually like to go too far with Townley. The NPL, it doesn't work. He uh, tries promoting oil. If he'd been around a few decades later, that might have worked. He also tried some faith healing, which, well, apparently that didn't work too well either. And at some point, he uh, briefly goes to California to uh, attempt to make his stepdaughter a movie star. Ultimately, comes back to North Dakota, becomes very anti-communist. The communists can't lose unless the Republicans wake up, and wake up fast. It speaks out pretty much any time he can get a chance, anti, uh, the anti-communist line, and he's actually preparing to run for Congress when he loses control of his car and uh, he dies. It wasn't a good life.
in the years before the league and in the years after the nonpartisan league, he was endlessly involved in big schemes. And he was definitely a man of great ambition. None of the big schemes ever worked out the way that the league had. Um, but he was constantly trying to figure out what the next thing was. In some ways, I like to think of Townley as an entrepreneur, as a person who thinks big, has big ideas, and is willing to put in the time to try to make them happen. Um, and who has some ability to connect with others and convince them that this thing might happen. Even though it only worked for him once. He always seems to have wanted to stand in opposition. Whether he's standing in opposition to the bankers as he takes out these loans to become not the Flax King, or whether he's standing in opposition to you know, somebody in the legislature says, go home and slop the hogs. He has to have somebody to tilt at. I think there's a very complex character there. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. But as always, thanks for watching. Funding for Minnesota Legacy Programs are provided by a grant from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Humanities Council and by the members of Prairie Public.